A particle physicist would ask you for thousands and thousands of them and then take them and collide them and smash them together. So how do we get this high energy that we can then put into Einstein's equation? If you think about how you accelerate something, you know, that this is the bottom line. We want to get our particles that we're going to smash into each other going as close to the speed of light as possible so that when they collide, there's a lot as much energy as possible that we hand to nature in E equals MC squared. So how do you accelerate something? Well, luckily, we know something about how particles interact. We know what forces they work with. So let me go back and think about gravity. How would you accelerate a rock? You could throw the rock. You could, you know, give it some momentum. Um, or we could let gravity do this work. We can use one of our, our fundamental forces of nature and drop the rock. And as long as it's able to fall, gravity will keep accelerating it. So that might be a way that we could get to very high energies, particularly if you imagine dropping the rock from very, very high heights. Um, but you can see we're only going to get the rock going so fast before we start to run into some problems, right? We're going to hit the ground at some point. Um, you can dig a really deep hole, but you, again, you're going to be only going so fast. Uh, another thing that can happen is there's going to be air resistance that's slowing our rocks down. So as we move into the realm of fundamental particles, we actually can learn a lot of lessons more than you might think from this dropping the rock exercise. We want to go to as high energy as we can, um, so we don't want anything slowing us down. So the accelerating that we do, we do in a vacuum. We make sure that our the equivalent of our rocks are not hitting any air resistance. And rather than using gravity, we use the forces of electricity and magnetism. So let's go back to opposites attract. Maybe you've heard that if I have two particles that have the same electric charge, they're going to be um, repelling each other. They're going to push away from each other. But opposite electric charges are going to attract each other. We understand enough about that idea behind electricity and magnetism so that we can accelerate our charged protons, they're positively charged, by putting them inside an electric field. And you can imagine my proton that's sitting between these two charged plates. I know my artwork leads a little bit to be desired. I apologize. It's not what my degree is in. But you can imagine this positive proton being pushed away from these positive charges. It doesn't want anything to do with it and at the same time being pulled toward these negative charges. And if you have really, really strong charges that are built up, you know, high levels of charge, you can get very high levels of field and you'll have this particle accelerating um, in, you know, in, in a really strong way, lots of forces that are acting on it. And this really is the basic building block of a particle accelerator. This is what it looks like. What you can do is you can put a bunch of these things lined up next to each other. Um, the equivalent of, you know, instead of dropping your rock just off um, from where you're standing, going off of a cliff, leaving it in these fields for a long time so that it gets going faster and faster and faster with the goal here to get it as close to the speed of light as we can before we smash it into other stuff. And we have a couple of techniques that we've built up that let us do this. Uh, we have linear accelerators where you have these particles going in a line. You can have two accelerators where the particles are, are accelerating toward each other and then smash in between, creating all of that energy. Or you can imagine a circular accelerator. And I love the circular accelerator. It's a little bit like cheating. What we're doing is by having a curved path, we manage to keep our particles inside that path for a really long time. So we can keep getting them going faster and faster and faster. And you have them circulating in both directions, getting faster and faster and faster until you steer them into each other and they collide. Um, so it's not, there's no such thing as a free lunch when you, when you have a circular accelerator, we need really strong magnetic fields to keep our particles actually bent in that circle. But it's, it's a real gain because we manage to hang on to those particles accelerating for a longer period of time. The Large Hadron Collider at CERN, which is where most of my research occurs, is our largest, our highest energy human-made collisions on the planet. It is a 27 kilometer ring that is on the border between France and Switzerland. 
the the main headquarters when we think of CERN is in Geneva, Switzerland. But if you really talk to the protons, it turns out they spend most of their time in France. Most of the ring is actually in on the French side. And we get these particles getting, um, we get them up to 0.99999, lots of nines times the speed of light, almost. Um, you can't get a massive particle going at the speed of light, but we get them going very, very fast, very close. And then we smash them into each other. Now, I'm an American. I'm over here on um, on this side of the pond at, at Yale, actually, right now. And when I think about 27 kilometers in terms of the, the extent of the Large Hadron Collider, the way that I translate that is one of the more um, formative experiences that I have had visiting the Grand Canyon. Here I am with my Grand Canyon um, back when my hair was a slightly different color, um, looking out over the, the the edge. I think it was five o'clock in the morning, really beautiful view. And um, I don't know how many of you have, if you've been to the Grand Canyon before, but maybe this gives you a sense of it. It is vast. And I've drawn here the Large Hadron Collider on a map of the, the Grand Canyon so that you can get a sense of it. It's essentially on the scale of the Grand Canyon. So this Large Hadron Collider accelerates these um, protons to close to the speed of light, and then has really fantastic collisions at multiple places around that 27 kilometer ring. I may have mentioned the whole thing is 100 meters underground, and I'll show you what, what an image of that looks like so that it's safe for, for people to be walking around on the surface and um, you know all, all, everything is happening underground. But we make absolutely spectacular collisions that we then have to analyze. And I'm going to say just a little bit about how that process works. How do we try to learn about this energy that we've created and see what has come out? Before I do that, I want to give you an analogy that I think is, is helpful when you think about how particle physicists think or how we work. It's been said that if a particle physicist is asked, how does a watch work? How does a, a, a timepiece work? How does it function? I know that this is becoming obsolete now that all of us have the our time on our phones, right? But if you imagine, you know, people having these timepieces, how does that work? A particle physicist would ask you for thousands and thousands of them and then take them and collide them and smash them together. And they would use the resulting detritus, all of the garbage, it's not garbage, the watch pieces that come out of this collision and using those pieces, how things fly out try to understand how the watch works. And maybe you can't accomplish that by smashing just one watch, one pair of watches together. But with enough data that's taken, you might start to see which pieces of the watch tend to be connected, which things come out together. Um, and okay, you know, the problem with this analogy is, of course, a rational thing to do if you want to understand how one of these timepieces works is open it up and, and look inside. The reality is we don't have that option with these particles. They're far too far for us to, they're far too small for us to see. We have to work with them through instruments that we create that give us a glimpse of what's actually happening in these collisions. So we use massive particle detectors. These have been described, you know, they're essentially exquisite cameras that have amazing uh, precision. In some ways, I really think that the analogy with a cathedral, it makes sense that the equivalent of a modern day cathedral for a particle detector, the Atlas detector that I work on is six stories high and it's a hundred meters long. It's the length of a football field. Uh, it has hundreds of millions of electronic channels and it has the job of trying to take the collisions that happen inside, all of these lines are representing particles streaming out from collision interaction points um, from actual data that was taken in 2016 at the Large Hadron Collider and, and try to make sense of it. Let us actually work with these particles and understand what came out of the collisions. What is it that was happening? And you can think about the basic design of a particle detector being uh, an onion. It's different layers and the layers have different jobs. And what we do is taking into account the ways that these particles, we can have thousands of them that are created in our proton-proton interactions, um, trying to understand how those particles interact with the different components of our detectors. And we're essentially detectives 
that look at the different signatures. And this is showing you if I'm a particle that's created at the center of one of our detectors, I stream through different kinds of detectors as I make my way out from the center outside, you know, coming out. And I actually, if I'm a particle that's created at the center of the detector, I myself might be traveling close to the speed of light through these particles. Or if you're a photon, a massless particle, trying traveling at the speed of light. And the cool thing is the detectors have been arranged so that different kinds of particles that can be created. And I just have some example names of a, a lot of the stuff that we make when we make these particle collisions. They leave different signatures in these different layers of the detector. I know that um, AI, artificial intelligence, it's one of the big things that, uh, that you know, it's, it's certainly a topic today. Um, and along with machine learning, we've been taking advantage of this and, and using it um, to, uh, yeah, to, to have great results for actually a long time in particle physics, developing algorithms and teaching those algorithms to learn to rep to recognize what different kinds of particles look like so that we can learn from the detect the, the collisions that happen in our detectors. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.